Hey, thanks everybody for showing up um, so early. So um, yeah, I talk about uh, extensor-based Qualcomm Wi-Fi chips. And um, so why even uh, looking at Wi-Fi chips? So in my opinion, these uh, Wi-Fi chips are pretty powerful chips. So even though they're just intended to be to run, uh, to do your Wi-Fi stuff, right? Uh, they are still general purpose um, uh, CPUs. So you, in theory, can run any software on it. But the problem is the proprietary binaries which uh, come with those uh, chips, they, they make it difficult to run your own code. And um, why would we even want to run our own code? So um, what we could do is uh, enable addition, additional functionality. I have a few examples um, in a few seconds. And uh, we could also uh, make security research easier. So um, we could, uh, in case we, we manage to enable uh, dynamic analysis, uh, security researchers um, have it easier to, to identify bugs and, uh, and yeah, report them to the uh, vendors. So um, some examples for um, additional features which we uh, want to, to enable is, for example, we uh, can enable monitor mode on chips which is not available by, by default. So for example, this is monitor mode on a Broadcom-based uh, chip uh, running on a Nexus 5, which is not available by default. And then you can uh, use your standard uh, uh, like Wi-Fi tools like, like uh, AeroDump and so on. Um, we could also um, uh, build a complete uh, state machine for uh, Berkeley packet filtering in inside the firmware and uh, then compile our uh, f rules for f packet filtering on the user space, upload them via the kernel to the firmware and run them directly in the firmware. So that way we could um, save some power when we do um, uh, monitor mode, basically. And uh, if we have access to uh, even a deeper layer um, uh, firmware code, we can also uh, implement like um, stuff which is closer to the physical layer of Wi-Fi. So here's an example of a pilot tone jammer, which uh, only jams the pilot tone of o OFDM to uh, be very power efficient. So uh, now that we have all these, these um, great goals in mind, so let's take a few steps back, uh, a few steps back and uh, look at the bigger picture. So in general, there are um, two kinds of Wi-Fi chips, so full Mac and soft Mac chips. We will uh, look at uh, full Mac chips in this talk. Um, the biggest difference is that uh, full Mac chips run the Mac layer inside the firmware. So uh, this also means if you want to change something in the, in the firmware, uh, in the Mac layer, you have to, to change the, the firmware directly. Um, so there's, it's not possible to do these changes on the driver itself. So um, the examples I have shown in the previous slides um, of stuff which we could want to enable, this was based on, um, on um, the, the Nextmon framework. So um, uh, this was, um, I, I developed this or t together with a colleague of mine back in uh, my time at the university. So this enables us to, so this framework will be used to uh, modify Broadcom chips and we even managed to uh, get deep modifications working as this, um, this gemma I showed earlier. And you can, you can get it at nextmon.org. And apart from Broadcom, um, there was also work done on Black Hat 2020 uh, about uh, Intel-based uh, chips and there was also a talk about hexagon-based Qualcomm chips on DEF CON 27 and Black Hat 2019. But this talk is the first uh, talk to um, explain extensor-based Qualcomm Wi-Fi firmware. So some background, um, how, to do, um, how are Wi-Fi socks um, structured? So normally you have an application core, um, and then uh, you separately you have your Wi-Fi core. So um, and uh, optionally, in some cases, you also have like an, a, a real-time core which handles like time-critical stuff, like the distributed coordination function in, in Wi-Fi. Um, and now for the, the chip which we will look at, um, there are like several drivers um, available. So uh, there's ADH10K by Qualcomm directly, and also a corresponding firmware with that. And then there's ADH10KCT by Candela Tech. So this is interesting. So Candela Tech bought the rights from Qualcomm a time ago, some time ago, and they uh, have their own driver and their own firmware. So they got the, the source code somehow from, from Qualcomm and um, um, added additional features. 
And so basically you have um, a, a complete separate uh, kind of uh, driver and firmware um, in addition to the original Qualcomm driver and firmware. And uh, lastly, there's also the, the QCL, QCA CLD driver by Qualcomm. And this is used for uh, factory processes. Um, and also what you can do is you can uh, use the uh, Candela Tech driver and run the Qualcomm firmware. This is also possible. So this is the, the chip and the board I have looked at. Um, it's the IPQ4019. It's um, based on a, a development board by eight devices. This board is called Habanero. And in the middle of it, you can see the, um, the, the, the chip we are, um, we are uh, interested in. And this is basically a development board for uh, Wi-Fi enabled home routers. So um, what does this board, uh, so this chip look like from the inside? So as I said, this is um, used for, uh, for uh, Wi-Fi enabled home routers. And one of the big vendors in Germany is also using it. So this is AVM, the Fritz box. And um, apart from this, the uh, chip consists of, uh, as I explained before, of, uh, also of an application core, and multiple Wi-Fi cores. And the application core runs on uh, OpenWRT, in this case, with a pretty old kernel. And uh, for Wi-Fi, they have one core for 2.4 gigahertz and one for 5 gigahertz. And they use uh, PCIe to communicate uh, with each other. So now to the firmware itself. Um, as I said, it's a Extensa-based uh, firmware. Extensa um, is, uh, um, initially, was initially developed by Tensilica, but now uh, it was bought for, uh, by, by Cadence. And it's a uh, little Endian um, firmware. It, comes, it consists of a ROM part and a RAM part. Um, the RAM part of this firmware is um, stored in the file system of the OpenWRT. And uh, it contains multiple segments, one that later, and it's LC77 compressed. The ROM can be patched, and there is also a code swap mechanism which allows you to, uh, or which allows the, the Wi-Fi core to evict um, code from uh, its own memory space to the host memory space. And of course, there's no security enabled by default, so no secure boot, no stack canaries, no address and randomization. Um, What's also nice is that there is already, um, by default, there comes this, this debug FS, which you can uh, compile into your driver. And this allows you to um, get direct memory access via this, this mem value uh, file. So you can directly read and write uh, memory directly into the chip. And there is also a debug mask, um, which is very useful, which you can set, uh, for example, during initialization of the, the, uh, the kernel module to increase the verbosity of the, the driver itself. Um, now, so the interfaces which are used between the, the basically the application core and the Wi-Fi core, so there are two interfaces. Um, the BMI interface, the bootloader management and messaging interface, is used during boot up, and it's implemented in ROM. So basically, during boot up, it, uh, this is used to, to start up the chip. Then after boot up, uh, the WMI uh, is used to, to communicate with uh, the, the chip. And this is uh, mostly done to send commands like, please now start Wi-Fi scanning, do channel configuration, stuff like that. So this is how, how the loading looks like. So um, the driver offers two methods for um, loading firmware, either via the, the, the BMI method or via a copy engine. And uh, because in our case, we have a compressed firmware, we need to use the BMI method. And uh, what's basically happening is that the firmware from the, the file system is passed through the driver uh, via BMI to the Wi-Fi core, and it's then uh, uncompressed on the Wi-Fi core itself. So this is the, the file structure of the, the firmware file. Um, so basically, there are two big parts, like this, this, uh, this upper one and this lower one. They are identified with an IE header. Um, and then after this, uh, there is uh, the segment header, and this is identified with this, um, these magic values here. It will tell you if it's compressed or not, and in, on which address it should be loaded uh, into the chip. And it will also tell you what's the decompressed size of this segment. And uh, if you notice already, um, there are, uh, in this case, the, um, the first part and the second part have the same address, so this, this uh, means that they get overwritten. 
Um, yeah, and then uh, apart from the segment uh, header, there's also the, some metadata, as I just explained, and then basically, and, and after this, the, the real data starts, and then it, it's compressed, and after this, the next metadata starts in the next uh, part, um, which is then also uh, of the firmware data, which is also compressed. So um, basically, why these two separate parts is, um, my assumption is that um, the first part is just needed for, for boot up, and um, you can also see it, it's um, much um, smaller in size than the, 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 the second part. And um, after this, we can basically override it with the, the real firmware code. And um, if you uh, look at the, the driver logs, you will see this whole process uh, being done twice. And I assume this is done to um, load up the, the first Wi-Fi core and the second Wi-Fi core. If you look at the, the memory layout, we can see that it's repeating. Um, so um, if you just um, do a, a long enough read of, um, of your address space, you will see these patterns. And uh, my assumption is that this is used to realize um, different uh, memory access rights. So you can have the same memory on different offsets, and depending on offset, you, you can uh, realize different um, access rights. So this, yeah. Um, then to the extensor architecture, so um, there are two major things I want to point out about this, this architecture, which were new to me and uh, which also um, um, came with some problems. So the first one is the use of literal pools. So each load instruction, so this is just a load instruction, instead of being PC dependent, it's uh, basically independent of that. and you just uh, calculate an offset to, to a fixed literal base to get an uh, I I immediate value. And um, in addition to that, there is also um, uh, um, like uh, windowed registers. And um, so this means that, um, so that way I explain it in a second, but what it's used for is basically to um, not needing to, to store and uh, as to save and restore your registers when you call a function. So here in this example, you, you can, uh, it's, it's using uh, call eight, so there, there can be different um, values here, or four or 12 or whatever. And, um, but my firmware used to call eight, and uh, if you load a um, value in A10 and you call a function, it will be available in A2 of the call E. Okay, so this is how this, this, these window registers look like. So basically you have these overlapping sections in your, in, your, um, um, in your memory space and you have like way more registers than you need for, for one um, function. And that way they, they can just shift the, the window for each function call if you have nested functions and um, um, uh, they, they can um, basically just, just rename it and then make it accessible to, to the next function. Um, this is how literal pools work. So um, now the memory space is, is horizontal. So um, assume we have a function mypatch which wants to call a, a, a function wlan main. So here we, um, uh, we uh, this will also be, um, uh, so the example for this will look like that there's first a, a load instruction which loads the intermediate value into a register and then uh, the call is just using this register to, um, to call the function. And um, if we want to, to get this, the, uh, the immediate value, we need to uh, know the, the literal base and then we can look up the offset for uh, this function we want to call, here wlan main in this case, and then we get the, the actual address of the function. So for example here. And this is done for each uh, load instruction. So um, this means, uh, or what's, what's also the case is that um, this, this literal base needs to be set up somewhere, and this is usually done at the very beginning of the firmware, and um, it, this is a, a fixed value. So for me it was uh, hex 40, uh, 8001, and this is the code, uh, how it looks like. So you basically um, um, have the start of this uh, literal pool and its size, and then uh, you store it into A2 and uh, write this to the special register, lit base. And uh, so actually the offsets are negative. This is why you uh, add the whole size to it and then uh, um, um, a load instruction later on will, will have a ne negative offset. 
Um, so basically, the existing firmware does expect that this literal pool is used. So um, if we want, and this has um, some, uh, this comes with some problems if you want to patch existing code. Another problem was that um, this lit base is not supported by disassemblers. So, for example, IDA 7.7 added support for Extensa, but has uh, does ignore the, the lit base um, um, call. Um, for Chitra, there is a, an Extensa plugin, but it didn't support uh, lit base either. Uh, Radar 2 ignored lit base, has support for Extensa, and um, there's also a binary plug, uh, Ninja plugin, but it, it ignored lit base as well. So um, what I need to do is uh, create some patches for um, Binary Ninja in this case. So uh, in this patch, I just um, ignore the uh, dependency of the program counter and um, directly use this, this fixed lit base. And I have a similar, so this is the patch for Binary Ninja. And uh, there's also, and this is the patch for, for Chidra, which works the same way. And um, I have a, 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 I have a link to a Git repository later on where you can find these patches. So um, now, if you actually want to to change some code in the firmware, I decided to to use the, the next one framework I have shown uh, earlier, and um, I wanted to to basically modify it to support uh, Qualcomm-based uh, Wi-Fi chips. And um, so this is how the, the framework looks like. It's a, it's pretty um, um, yeah, uh, complicated, but um, we only need a subset of this to, to make it work. So what we could do with the original next one was we could extract the ROM, flash patches, the RAM, U-code uh, for Broadcom-based Wi-Fi chips, and we could uh, use C to uh, write our patches, and of course we could uh, um, call existing firmware functions. And then in the end, uh, um, with this whole framework, we, we were able to create a, a firmware file, which we could then uh, run on Broadcom-based um, Wi-Fi chips. So um, how does this, this next one framework uh, work on a high level? So uh, we have um, you know, our own patches, which are in, in patch.c. We have a wrapper.c, which is used to, um, to uh, have some stops for the uh, functions which are uh, already existing in the, in the firmware. And we use GCC and a GCC plugin to uh, compile the .o files. And also, the, the plugin will um, help to create this nextmod.pre file. And this nextmod.pre file basically contains some metadata, which we use in, in later on. And uh, for example, we can use this file with an org script to create some linker scripts. And then we can use the linker scripts and the, the O file to create an overall patch file. So this patch file basically includes everything which we need. And now, um, uh, after this, we, we can uh, create a, a use another uh, make file and the elf file to uh, create basically a blueprint to copy out the relevant section of this elf file. So uh, we, we might not need everything, just the, the, the patch we, we wanted to introduce and, the, um, uh, and some, some, some stuff we might want to override in the original function, and the original firmware. So um, now we have this, this elf file and the, the, um, the, this make file, which is basically the, the blueprint for object copy. We uh, can copy out the relevant sections. Then we can DD them into the firmware, uh, the, the firmware binary. So this is how the, the original net, next one worked. So uh, I need to do some changes to, to make it work for Qualcomm. So first of all, there was no support for uh, decompression. The, the Broadcom-based firmware had no uh, uh, compression. It was just uh, the whole memory, uh, the, the RAM, uh, whole RAM of the, the uh, chip, basically, uncompressed. Um, it also, uh, also needed to add support for multiple binaries. So um, as we have seen earlier, the, uh, the firmware consists of, of multiple uh, segments, and I needed to add support for that. And um, we also needed support for uh, the lit base I mentioned earlier. And then uh, if we make this happen, what we could do is uh, compile and link our own patches. We could uh, um, uh, patch these, this, the second segment I showed earlier. And then we uh, can compress it back into the second segment, add some padding bytes, and then write the, um, the, the firmware uh, file, basically. So this is, this is the plan. Um, 
So uh, I will not explain the, the decompression. This is um, pretty straightforward to implement. I will uh, start with the um, support for multiple binaries. So I needed to extend the, the GCC plugin, uh, which creates this, this uh, metadata file, the next one, .pre file. And um, so basically what this uh, GCC plugin does, it looks for this attribute in, in the source code. And uh, this attribute tells um, basically where the following, the code after this goes into the firmware, in which chip uh, this is used, uh, and in which firmware version this is used in. And I extended this basically to also include the, um, the, the um, target firmware file. So uh, after compiling, where should this go to? And to so for which segment of the, um, of the uh, firmware file should this go into? Um, so um, after, uh, so basically, then after we compile everything, we have this 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 new uh, next one to pre file, and um, it it basically contains the the address which is here uh, where our uh, code should go. It has basically a, the type, so here it's a patch. Then if it's a dummy, it's basically uh, an existing function in the firmware. It's the the, dot, uh, the next column is the dot o file, but this will be compiled into. This is the name of the text section in the .l file, and now we also added this, this um, uh, the name of this uh, bin file where the, the compiled code should later on be copied into via DD. So uh, with this, I already wanted to, to compile some patches. Um, so my goal was to uh, use this pretty simple patch. So just uh, jump into some code, into this function, then, uh, and then write uh, one, two, three, four, basically, into this memory location, and then jump to the um, original code, which is WLAN main in this case. Um, I could use the uh, ESP32 uh, GCC compiler to compile my um, my, my stuff and um, and load it into the, the, the chip. Um, and I used the debugfs, uh, which I have shown earlier, to check, basically, after the chip was up, if um, uh, if the memory address has uh, changed accordingly, but uh, this didn't work, um, and the reason is uh, these lit base uh, this this lit base I, I, I have explained earlier. So basically, all the, the load instructions expect this lit base to be uh, set at the very beginning of the the firmware code, and um, so th this means like. The, the, the chip which uh, runs the existing firmware code expects uh, a load to, to honor this, this lit base. And um, I need basically now some way to, to uh, tell my code um, uh, either, like th there is this existing uh, lit base, please use this, and it's like already this filled up. But um, unfortunately, there is like no such parameter existing in, in GCC. Um, so we need to do something else. And uh, I just highlighted here the, all the, the load instructions, which are problematic. As I said, um, the, um, the offsets are not right. Uh, they, they need to uh, use these, th this lit base. So what we could do as an alternative is just avoid load instructions and uh, handcraft our assembly uh, ourselves. So we just avoid all the references um, and have basically no uh, immediate values. So is obviously not something we want to do in the long run. Um, uh, so I came up with two possible solutions. Either, uh, as I said earlier, we can tell the linker somehow um, uh, where the existing lit base is and how full it is, or we can uh, use our own lit base value. So I decided to go with the second option. Uh, I felt like that this is more, um, uh, more flexible in the long run. Um, and what, uh, what this implies is basically that I set the lit base to zero at the um, entry of every function. This can be done using the GCC plugin. And uh, at the function exit, I need to reset it to its original value. So, and uh, I needed to do this uh, into the, the assembler itself because there is this uh, target dependent feature which is called like relaxation. So if you have like a call to a function, this assembler will basically relax this to a load and a call. And then we have, again, a call which is problematic. Um, so how does this look like uh, in the assembly? Um, so as I said, this relaxation is problematic. Um, and uh, after relaxation, we basically have these, uh, a call is extended to, to, to two instructions, this load and this call. 
So what we would and the, the, the thing is that um, in between those two, basically, we need to reset the, um, the lit base to its original value, so that then if I call uh, the existing function, that the, um, the, the remaining code can can run uh, as intended. And um, yeah, it took me a while to find out that I cannot manipulate this behavior in GCC. It needs to be patched in the assembler directly because it's target dependent. So how does this uh, relaxation look like in the assembler? So basically you have this sort of a lookup table. On the left-hand side, it's looking for a pattern like this. So here uh, it's looking for a call eight. And if it finds uh, this, this kind of pattern, it will be relaxed to a load and a call a uh, x eight. So and, and what I basically need to do is um, find the place in the assembler where this um, these uh, built instructions, so basically the uh, right-hand side here, these are called built instructions, where those are, um, are, um, are, are iterated through and then uh, they're applied uh, and pushed on a stack. And um, all I did is basically to look like, is the uh, current opcode a call X? And was the previous, uh, previous opcode op a load instruction? And th if this is the case, then I can basically add an uh, an additional instruction which will reset the, the lit base with an uh, WSR instruction. So um, now that, that we know all of this and we have patched our assembler, we can go back to our original um, patching code and um, we can use this GCC plugin and the, the, um, the uh, patched assembler to compile this, this much easier to look at code, um, which is pretty nice. And then, uh, so this is the, how the assembly looks like, basically. Um, after we have saved our, um, our uh, parameters, we will um, save the uh, current lit base into A15. We will write zero into A14 and write uh, A14 into the, uh, the lit base uh, value. And then we can do all of our load instructions. And at the end, we reset uh, uh, or we uh, copy back the value which we have stored in A15 into the lit base value before we do the final callout. So there are still uh, some open problems with this. So this uh, implementation is not very good, obviously. Um, I take away two registers uh, for the assembler. Um, it would be better to have this uh, based on, on, on a stack-based uh, implementation. Um, also, um, there is like uh, this, this support of disassemblers, which I, I mentioned earlier. So I have these, these, um, these patches, but still, um, it's, for example, you, you cannot use IDA if you want to. Um, and also, there is no support in, in, in this uh, GCC I'm using for, for naked functions. So this is a problem. So what I do is, what, what, uh, like you need some way to, sometimes to override an existing call um, and the firmware to uh, even get to your patch. And uh, either you're lucky and it's like um, uh, they, they are using the literal pool, then you can just override the value in the literal pool. But if not, if it's like a direct call, then you need to some way to um, just compile like a, a call to, to your own code. And um, you could easily do this with uh, naked functions. But uh, in this uh, GCC version, or like uh, uh, GCC for extensa at least, does not have this uh, option for for naked functions. Um, and also, uh, what's also missing right now is that there is like no text console, um, so you cannot uh, just do a printf and uh, somehow dump this during uh, in, in your host system to, to do some basic debugging. But we could implement this ourselves now. So uh, basically, um, I uh, have this very creative name now for my framework, which is called QCAMON instead of Nexmon. Um, so this is how the folder structure looks like. Um, at the very top, uh, you have um, some build tools, then uh, the, the disassembler patches, which I mentioned earlier, for Chidra and uh, Banner Ninja. And then there's a folder for the original firmwares and a folder for uh, our patches, which we want to apply. The, uh, the build tools contain um, uh, the patched uh, assembler and GCC and also the, the GCC plugin. The, the firmware uh, folders uh, basically contains the, the original um, firmware, and it already comes with a structure which would allow uh, different chips and different firmware versions. 
And uh, there is also a make file which already extracts uh, the relevant parts and decompresses them. And then in the end, we have our patch folder, um, which we can use to, to store our, uh, our source code, which we want to introduce into the firmware. So now to a brief demo. Um, so this will basically show uh, the, the, the code I had in my slides earlier. So um, we just want to uh, set uh, like uh, uh, 1234 uh, or store 1234 into this uh, memory address and then jump to the original code. And then in addition to what I've shown earlier, we also need these two lines to basically uh, have an entry point into our um, uh, uh, firmware code. So all I'm doing here is um, creating basically f um, overriding stuff in the, in the literal pool to uh, point to, to my code. So, um, and, uh, so everything is prepared um, uh, in, in the repository. You just need to uh, run uh, make, and this will uh, already uh, compile uh, the, the C files and .o files. It will uh, also uh, compile the wrapper, it will create the linker scripts, and create the .l file, and then use the, uh, this blueprint um, make file I mentioned earlier to uh, copy out the relevant parts um, and bin files. And then we can start reassembling the, the whole uh, firmware file uh, via compressing it, adding uh, some padding bytes, and then um, basically creating uh, the, the firmware file how it's re um, expected by the, by the, uh, the Wi-Fi chip. So here it's called uh, firmware-5.bin. And uh, we can, uh, I will now SSH into this, this, uh, this board I, I've shown earlier. And uh, in order to access the, the debug FS, we first need to set up the, the WLAN zero interface. Now we can uh, go into the debug FS and uh, look at the, the memory um, location uh, basically without any modifications. So for this, I can just use um, DD, DD to uh, copy out the relevant section and use Hextum to look at it. So here we see that uh, the first few bytes are not one, two, three, four. <laughs> and uh, now we, we install our uh, modified firmware. Just copy it over via SCP, and um, we will um, need to um, uh, remove and add the PCIe driver um, to um, apply the changes. Now we can uh, SSH back into the router. Um, just checking uh, the kernel log real quick. So here it's uh, already setting up the regulatory dom domain, so this looks quite good, so it did not crash on us. And um, we can go back into the debug FS, set up the uh, WLAN zero first, go back to the debug FS. Then basically we, we can uh, copy out the, um, the same memory location which we just did a second ago, and have a look at it via the hex dump. Yeah, and as if, if you can see here, we modified two whole bytes. Yeah, thanks. So with this, um, a quick summary and future work. So um, I was able to uh, modify next one frame to make next one framework to um, to uh, make it work with the, the Qualcomm based uh, firmwares. Uh, I have a, the demo page uh, patch I have shown. Uh, it's uh, in, you, you can get it via this um, this uh, location. There is uh, also the um, the patches for binary ninja and Gdraw in there, the GCC plugin, and already a pre-compiled version of GCC, and um, also the patched um, binutils file for the assembler. Um, yeah, so this shows that it's possible uh, to. Um, um, make modifications on Qualcomm-based firmwares. There are still uh, some improvements which I need to do to, to make uh, modifications even more easier. I also want to look at this production uh, software uh, driver uh, thing I mentioned at the very um, beginning, so this, this uh, QCA CLD. So this is basically using this uh, QDAL software on, on a PC to, to, to communicate, and you, you can uh, get it from some sketchy Chinese uh, servers. And then um, I want to see if I can maybe uh, enable some features which are used in this production software 
um, also by myself. And I also want to look into this, this code swap feature a little bit more. So I, I want to thank uh, Martin Kort, uh, aka Problem Kaput. So he did some awesome uh, Game Boy Advance reverse engineering. Uh, and uh, I had some, he helped me out in, in some cases. So it turns out that he did not even uh, reverse engineer the, the, the main processor of the Game Boy Advance, but also like the, um, the Wi Fi chip used there. And this turns out to be like an older Atheros based uh, Wi Fi chip, which um, yeah, he also reverse engineered. And Atheros later on was also bought by, by Qualcomm. And uh, yeah, I think like lots of knowledge from back uh, there uh, still went into their products. And I also want to thank uh, Roku, uh, aka RK Nibble. I used her script to, um, to do the un uh, zipping of uh, the, the firmware file. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thanks, everybody. If you want to reach out, here's my email address. Yeah, if you have any questions, shoot. I have also one more note. Um, I have uh, I found a... Um, a firmware file which contains all debug symbols for this IPQ4019 chip. Uh, I have no easy way to distribute this without uh, the original repository being taken down. Um, but if you want to um, poke it at yourself, um, reach out to me. I will send you the link. Any questions? No? Okay, then. Thanks, everybody.